Okay, we want to take a look at Boyle's Law. Uh, Boyle's Law is pretty simple. Uh, it says the pressure times the volume. I use a kind of a fancy V for volume so you don't get it mixed up with velocity uh, uh, is equal to, and you may, have, I'm sure you talked about this in chemistry, if not in physics, uh, PV equals NRT. N is the number of moles of gas, which you know from chemistry. R is universal gas constant, uh, and T is the temperature. Now, the important thing in this formula is that all these numbers, all these values, P and V and T, uh, are absolute quantities. That is, this is the absolute temperature, which, or the Kelvin temperature. Uh, this is, <laughs> there is only absolute volume. The smallest volume you can have is zero obviously. So this is already absolute automatically. And P is the absolute pressure. That's the pressure above no pressure, above outer space. So keep that in mind. So these are all absolute values. So the point is, for Boyle's Law, uh, it's a special case of the universal gas, uh, ideal gas law, which is that. Uh, but Boyle's Law uh, in, involves a case where the temperature remains constant. And the temperature in this case is, is room temperature. So we hope that remains relatively constant during the lab. So we'll just call that big C. So here's Boyle's law. The absolute pressure times the volume of a confined amount of gas, not just gas in general, but it has to be trapped, confined, is, remains constant. So as the pressure goes up, the volume's got to go down. Or as the volume goes up, the pressure's got to go down uh, to make that product constant. So we're going to vary uh, the volume, which is going to vary the pressure. Uh, and again, as I said a minute ago, they're inversely related. Okay, so uh, we'll use distilled water. Uh, we're going to, uh, as you know, it's, it varies a little bit with temperature. And, and we're not at 4 degrees, fortunately, in the room, where it's exactly 1. Uh, but we're going to call it really close to one. We're, we're not worried about that difference. It's, it's like a 0.2% difference uh, between room temperature and 4 degrees. So uh, here's the apparatus. And this is, uh, I'll show you the real apparatus. By the way, this is a very uh, teetery apparatus. It doesn't have a very big base. And so it's easy to knock over. So please don't knock it over, because all kinds of water will pour everywhere if you do. So we'll do it on the tables uh, just for convenience. If you uh, are nervous about that, well, do it on the floor then. OK, so this is the, the volume of gas. Uh, I didn't have to fill this with air. It's automatically filled with air uh, at uh, the pressure of air today, uh, which we're going to need to know, or we're going to actually find out also. Uh, so this is filled with air at atmospheric pressure, which is significant. Uh, and uh, when we lower this tube into uh, this other tube, by the way, there's a, there's a mark here, which you'll notice when you, fill, when you look at this. If the, if the water level is not filled up to that mark, add a little bit of water and add distilled water uh, to, the, uh, to the tube so that it's at that mark or just slightly above it. OK, so pretty obviously, uh, I'm going to lower this in. And you want to lower it not at an angle, but straight down so that when, when the bottom of the tube hits the water, it hits it uh, square. So we're going to lower this tube. And you're going to see, let's just lower it pretty much all the way down. Uh, you'll see down here that the water is uh, being Everybody knows if you've watched a uh, submarine movie, you know pressure increases with depth. I'll, I'll write that formula down in a minute, too. Um, but pressure increases with depth. And so we're not studying that today. We're studying Boyle's Law. But so the pressure down here is more than the pressure uh, of air pressure, which is the, air, the pressure on the top of this water column and everywhere else in the room. And so the volume is increased slightly. Not very much. This is about 90 centimeters long. You need to measure that very carefully. We'll talk about that also. And we need to measure this distance here, uh, which is called little y. We'll go over that on the sketch in a minute. Uh, you need to measure that very carefully. It's not a very big number, so you have to be very sure 
of your reading, which of course means you need to read it a few times and take an average. So this is little y. The whole length of this tube, which is about 90 or 91 centimeters, is, is just big L. And uh, the, the distance between the water level and the top here is, is big, big D. Big D stands for depth here. Uh, we don't put any minus signs on things. Pressure increases with depth. And I guess you could make a depth a negative, but it's really, uh, don't worry about the negative signs. Pressure increases with depth. OK, so the, the depth to which this top of this uh, column is inside the two in, inner tube is D. It's from about um, 6 centimeters down here all the way up to the top here. So that's D. That would be the depth to which the, the gas is pressurized. And this gas here has a density that's much, much, much less than the density of water. So we're not going to worry about any variation in the, in the pressure in the gas. It's almost none from the top to the bottom of the gas. So that pressure down there is the pressure at the bottom of the gas. It's the pressure everywhere in the gas. So uh, that's the pressure of the gas. That's, well, it's not big P. It's little p. We have to talk about that. It's called the gauge pressure. So let's go back. And again, uh, I think the thing, uh, when, you, when you pressurize uh, 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 a, 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 subs a system like this, uh, what happens is there's some dissolved air in, in water, of course. And uh, it's, it's kind of best to, instead of just doing this three times, uh, and just kind of moving it up and down and reading the, uh, the readings here. Uh, you need to read the, the, the height here. Uh, and right now I've got this at 50 centimeters. You need to hold it exactly 50 centimeters. Try to hold this uh, inner tube uh, pretty much straight. Uh, and that's the distance. That's the distance here at the top here. And D is the distance between that and the bottom of the tube. Um, so uh, you want to read this very carefully, as I say. Uh, since there's some dissolved gases in the water, you might want to just take it out, let the tube drain out, and push it back down to 50 centimeters, uh, and read what this says here, for instance. Now we're going to go, we're going to do depths of 10 centimeter increments, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. And if you've got the right amount of water in here, you can go up to, and I don't have enough water in, so I'm, I'm going up to 79 something. Okay, I put a little more water in so I can get it up to 80. So this mark needs to go. You need to fill it up a little bit past that mark. Uh, not so much past, just spill it all over the place when you dunk the tube. So we're going to go from 10 to 80 centimeters and 10 centimeter increments. <clears throat> That's going to give you nine readings. Uh, OK, so that's how you do the experiment. It's pretty simple. Uh, <clears throat> but you uh, have to have two people to do this, one to hold the inner tube at the uh, exact height in 10 centimeter increments, uh, and the other person to very carefully read the bottom. And of course, you have a little meniscus problem, so that's for you to decide where the top of the water column really is. Uh, <clears throat> try not to let these things roll off the table put them in between something so that they don't roll off the table. Uh, so that's the experiment. It's pretty simple. So let's take a look at the, uh, at the analysis. Let me get this out of your way. <clears throat> so Boyle's Law, P times the volume, the absolute pressure uh, times the volume is a constant. Uh, we have to realize that. Uh, the absolute pressure, big P, is equal to uh, the gauge pressure, little p, plus the barometric pressure, big, big B. <clears throat> so we need to learn how to use the uh, uh, barometer. We have a 100-plus-year-old barometer. It doesn't mean it's not accurate because it's that old. Uh, it means uh, that you have to be very careful with it because it's that old. I sh we'll show you how to run that. So we need the barometric pressure. Um, 
And if you add to that, if you go into outer space, the barometric pressure is zero. So up in outer space, the gauge pressure and the absolute pressure are the same because you're with reference to zero pressure. Here, with re we're with reference to uh, actually a very high pressure. Uh, normal atmospheric pressure, average atmospheric pressure, standard atmospheric pressure is 101.3 kilopascals. Pascals are newtons per meter squared. That, those are the units for pressure, uh, force per area. Okay, so uh, this number is not involved in the process because we're going to use what's called millimeters or centimeters of mercury. Uh, and we'll explain that over at the barometer. So this is going to be in, in centimeters of mercury. That's going to be a little bit of a problem in our analysis because here we have, as you already know, centimeters of water. And centimeters of mercury, and mercury is 13.6 times as dense as water. And so pressure caused by one centimeter of mercury is 13.55, actually, times greater than the pressure caused by one, a, a column of one centimeter of water. So we have to convert from centimeters of water, which we have in this part, to centimeters of mercury, which is uh, what the barometer reads. So the gauge pressure is the barometric pressure, <coughs> uh, sorry, is the absolute pressure minus the barometric pressure. So let me make this a little bit more clear. This is little p, uh, and that's big P, the absolute pressure, which belongs in Boyle's law. Okay, so that's what we're going to be studying. Uh, we're going to measure the barometric pressure. We're also going to find graphically the barometric pressure, and I want you to compare the graphical value you get for the barometric pressure with the barometric pressure you measure more accurately on the barometer. Okay, so that's kind of where we're at. Uh, pressure here, if we look at Boyle's Law, pressure, again, absolute pressure, is some constant divided by the volume. Okay, so I can replace uh, this as absolute pressure. I can replace that. So little p, uh, the pressure that we're going to get, the gauge pressure, is uh, some constant over the volume minus B. Okay, so that's, that's our relationship that we're going to study. And we can study this. It's obviously a linear relationship. Well, not quite. It's a linear relationship. It's an inverse linear relationship. That is, pressure is related to the inverse of the volume, which is what Boyle's Law says. The more pressure, the less volume. The more volume, uh, the less pressure. So uh, it's inverse relationship. So we can compare this to, uh, we'll use a little b here, uh, just so you don't think that's something special. b is the y-intercept. This is the slope-intercept form of uh, a straight line. This is, the, this is the straight line or linear relationship if we make x equal to or related to 1 over the volume. Okay, so we have to plot uh, gauge pressure uh, versus 1 over the volume. And it's not quite that simple either. But when we do that, we get a straight line and it should look something like this, where it goes through the y-axis at, you probably guessed it, minus the barometric pressure. So uh, this graph will give us two important things, which verifies uh, Boyle's law. The fact that the data fit very nicely on a straight line means that the data is fitting this theory very nicely. And the y-intercept is minus the barometric pressure, which we're going to measure in a different sort of way with a more accurate instrument. So uh, because air is not an ideal gas really, and this is the ideal gas law here, you're going to get some theoretical discrepancy between your answer and the ideal theoretical case here. That's one thing. And of course, there's also uh, reading errors and so forth. 
error analysis, you know. So your reading errors are basically how well can you read the position of the, of the uh, 80 centimeters, 50 centimeters, 10 centimeters on top, and how well can you read the rather smaller change of the, of the column of water inside the inner tube that creates the pressure uh, above atmospheric pressure. Um, uh, how, how accurately can you read that? So that's why we take several readings of, especially the, the little distance, little y on the bottom, to get a really accurate um, average. And the error there is your, your large, uh, largest uh, single error. Okay, there's one more, a couple more things that we have to talk about here. Again, centimeters of mercury, centimeters of water. So we have to convert this volume and, and there's, a, there's a nice table which you will get with your lab, which looks like this. And that will, that's, a, that, that's going to be a tear off sheet. So tear it off and fill in the blanks. Uh, it's going to give you, it's going to ask for the, the little Y here that you read very carefully, get an average. Uh, it's going to then uh, ask you for the value of d minus y, that is how far down from the top of this water level is the actual pressure in the air. That's the pressure as measured at the top of that column. We talked about that a minute ago. Uh, and then we have to convert that to mercury pressure instead of water pressure because we're, we're going to be plotting this in terms of barometric pressure in terms of uh, centimeters. Uh, of mercury. Uh, so, sorry, that, that should be millimeters of mercury. Uh, 760 centimeters of mercury is, is B. Okay. So, 76 centimeters is three quarters of a meter, uh, a couple feet. And so, uh, we'll see that the barometer is, has a mercury column a couple feet tall, 76 or 74 centimeters tall. Um, uh, for barometric pressure, whatever today's barometric pressure is. So that's what we're going to get here, today's barometric pressure, graphically and from the uh, uh, barometer. Okay, so uh, we have to convert, and that's pretty, pretty obvious, that, and conversion is pretty obviously, uh, since the density of, of mercury is 13.55 times the density of water. We have to, uh, a column of water this big corresponds to a column of mercury only that big, 13 times smaller. So we have to take our values for y uh, and convert them to uh, column, uh, column heights of mercury, which means uh, we have to multiply y by 1 over 13.55 to convert it to y for mercury. So already y is only a few centimeters. And when I divide that by 13, I'm talking about a few millimeters. And so it's very, very important to measure this y business, this y distance, very carefully because I'm going to make it 13.6 times smaller uh, when you, before you put it in the equation. So we have to convert from water uh, uh, centimeters of water to centimeters of mercury, and then we're going to compare that to the barometric pressure in centimeters of mercury. So there's a column to convert from water pressure to, uh, uh, well, I, should, I should say, volume in, uh, in terms of water to volume in terms of mercury, and then um, get the final set of data, nine data points uh, along this line here to get the, the linear relationship. Uh, the, the, the slope here is, of course, related to C here. Uh, and uh, what I did in, in the write-up is I replaced C prime, which is a slope, by C over volume. So uh, it doesn't matter what the number the value for C or C prime is, They're, they differ by the volume of gas, uh, you just need to know that they're constant. So uh, that's all we're showing. Uh, we don't care how much gas is in that tube. Uh, we just want to show that for a confined amount of gas, 
this relationship holds. When you measure uh, the length of this tube, big L, you want to measure up uh, the entire length of the tube. This uh, scale theoretically starts at zero, and it's a centimeter scale, just like on a meter stick. And uh, it goes to the, not quite to the top of this tube. That is, if you look at, this, look at the side here, this uh, plastic, black plastic cap is a couple millimeters wide. So you want to measure to about two millimeters uh, inside of that, because that's where the air column stops. So whatever this distance is, minus eh, about two, cent two millimeters is actually the length of L. The two, cent, two millimeters really is almost ignorable uh, and doesn't add any big significant error, but why put it any error in at all? Take a couple of millimeters off the value for big L when you put it in to the relationships here. Okay, that's it for the theory. And uh, did you get, did you, yeah. you went over there, okay. All right, so let's go, let's go take a look at the barometer. So this is our barometer. I think chemistry still has theirs upstairs, but it's not as classy as this. This is a barometer made by the Queen Company, the Queen Instrument Company. And the Queen Instrument Company uh, went out of business in 1918. So this is probably, uh, probably 1893 is my guess, is when this was made, because the, the monks from uh, St. Benedict's Abbey went over to uh, the Columbian Exposition in St. Louis, I believe it was, in 1893. They missed, they missed the 500th anniversary of the founding of the country by one year. They couldn't get the buildings built in time. In any case, uh, they went to the Columbian Exposition and uh, bought a bunch of equipment, which we still have. Uh, some of it's out in the hall over here. As you come to the lab, you might take a look at some of those. Wimshurst machines, which we'll talk about next semester. And this was another purchase of theirs in, I think, 1893. So it's, it's about 120-some years old, probably. Anyhow, so uh, inside here, there is a, uh, you have a little window here, and there is a, uh, a mercury column that, as I said earlier, two, two and a half feet, uh, 76 centimeters of mercury. There's a pot of mercury down here, and the, and the pot of mercury uh, is pushing in on the inner tube here, which is like the tube that had water in it that we talked about just briefly. Uh, that tube, it was evacuated. The way this was made, and I don't recommend this, is you, you, they, they took this tube, they filled it full of mercury, put their finger over the uh, end of the tube, and in, inverted it uh, and put it in uh, the machine here so that this is the, was the bottom of the tube. And so there's a vacuum here which simulates outer space. And so this is a sort of a, uh, a model of the pressure at the Earth's atmosphere and uh, compared to the pressure of zero, uh, zero gauge pressure, uh, uh, in outer space. So wherever this is, is the pressure in outer space, which is the absolute pressure. So. Uh, and down here is uh, this column of mercury more, 76, roughly 74 centimeters probably, uh, roughly uh, more than the gauge, than the absolute pressure uh, in outer space. So uh, this pot, uh, this little plug here is loose because it's, it's actually open to the air so that when the air pressure changes, the pressure in this column changes and it's measuring barometric pressure. So we have a couple of neat features here. This knob down here adjusts, and please be very careful with it, uh, adjusts the level of the mercury. There's a little piston that pushes the mercury up and down when you turn the screw. And over on the right side here is a, a pointer. Actually, it's an ivory pointer. It points down, and so when you adjust this knob very carefully till the mercury level just touches that pointer, that's your reference. Okay, and then once you do that, let's say I've done that, then I, uh, up here, uh, there's this white space back here. Uh, if you look straight through here, you'll see the, the white through the top of the column, which doesn't have mercury in it. 
and then this little knob here uh, adjust this scale here, which is a vernier scale, and adjust this. And so what you need to do is kind of adjust this, uh, look carefully, and lower this and, and until it just sits on top and or in front of uh, that Murphy column. Now, the way to make sure you've done that is to kind of bob your head up and down. Now, you've seen birds do it for other reasons. Uh, bob your head up and down a little bit and keep turning it down until at whatever the correct angle, you don't see any light through there, any white through there. Uh, and that means your the bottom of the scale is parallel, is horizontal to the top of the mercury column. And you're done. So you're done adjusting it. So on this side, on the right side, which is not only the right side, but the correct side, uh, we want to use uh, centimeters of mercury. So there's a vernier scale that goes from 0 to 10. And of course, like vernier scales, you know, uh, you line up the line that's closest to the line on the other side of the scale. If it's a sixth line up, then that, that is 6. That's a decimal of 6. So the bottom of the scale here is your reference, like the caliper. Uh, uh, you read the bottom of the scale. You can read to the nearest millimeter of mercury. Uh, for instance, 734, I don't know what this says right now, but 734 millimeters of mercury. And then if you look up in the, in the, in the, in the scales, maybe a little bit above 734, if it's halfway between 734 and 735, you're going to get the, the, number, the line, line number 5 lining up best to tell you it's 734.5 or 734.7. Whatever it lines up, whatever two lines line up best, call it that. So you get your... Uh, barometric pressure to the nearest tenth of a millimeter of mercury, which is very, very accurate. Because Atchison is uh, 850 or so feet above sea level, we're never going to have uh, 760 millimeters of air pressure. Simply, that's the weight of a column of air, like this, uh, weighing down on you, uh, going up hundreds of miles. Uh, we're going to have a number like maybe around 750 or 740 uh, or 75 or 74 uh, millimeters, centimeters of mercury. Uh, and on, on, a, on a nice sunny day like today, the pressure is going to be higher. Why is that? Because dry air is more dense, slightly more dense than, than wet air and moist air. And on a about to rain day, a rainy day, or if it's pouring rain outside, the barometric pressure is going to be lower because a, a, a significant percentage of the air has got water vapor in it, and and water vapor is actually less dense than either nitrogen or oxygen. Look at the formula: H2O, that's 18; oxygen, that's 32; nitrogen, that's uh, 28. So it's less dense. And so the barometric pressure is going to go down. It's just that simple. That's all there is to it. OK, so let's take a close up of the pot down here of adjusting and uh, also reading the uh, vernier here. And I will uh, adjust this and then show you what the reading is and read that scale. OK, this is the uh, setup for uh, the linear expansion coefficient. Again, the expansion coefficient is some number like some number times 10 to the minus 4 or minus 4 or 5 per degree. That's how much, that's what fraction of something expands or contracts when you heat or cool it. Uh, obviously, your car is not two, three feet longer in the summer than it is in the wintertime. And so this is a really small change, which, which is why we have to have a very fine uh, meter, uh, a micrometer, a micrometer measures to the millionth of a meter, uh, that's this, to, uh, to measure this, because it's a really small change. So we're going to have, you'll, you'll have two rods, and what we're going to do is do this experiment first, we do, do the Boyle's Law experiment while everything's kind of cooling back off here so I don't have, you don't have to touch it, and then we'll do the second rod after the Boyle's Law lab. Okay, so uh, you'll have two rods. Uh, this is the aluminum rod. This is the brass rod, it's kind of yellowish. And this is the copper rod, which is kind of uh, copperish, pinnyish, uh, reddish. So we'll, you'll have two of these rods. Uh, I don't know which two. Uh, 
and we'll do the expansion coefficient. Aluminum has actually the greatest expansion coefficient, so I'd like to do aluminum. Now, here's the jacket, the sort of insulating jacket you need to put this in, and this little clip here uh, is the clip that clips on this, what's called a thermistor. Uh, a thermistor is a thermal resistor, thermistor, uh, and it measures uh, temperature by measuring resistance. And so there's a little tag here that tells you at what temperature, what the resistance is. And we'll talk about uh, interpolating that tag a little bit later. So first of all, you have to measure uh, room temperature, which you do before you touch anything. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't know, I was holding this. I have to let it kind of re re gain room temperature. So I'm, I'm letting it sit here for a minute while I talk. And so uh, before I connect it, I want to measure, measure room temperature. Or if, you, if, this, if the rod's been sitting here and connected to the thermistor uh, or in the jacket, uh, uh, when, you get, when you get to your lab, then you can just turn the, the meter on and register room temperature before you touch anything. That would be the smart thing to do. So it's slowly creeping back to room temperature. Uh, this multimeter uh, is the first time you're using using this. Uh, you're going to be using it a lot next semester because we're going to do electricity and magnetism. And uh, it's got a whole bunch of scales. That's why they call it a multimeter. It measures resistance. It measures current. It measures voltage. It can even measure sound levels and decibels. And it can even measure uh, capacitance if you know how to run it. It can check transistors. It can do lots of things. A multimeter. So uh, over here at the roughly 8 o'clock position is the is 200K, which means 200 kiloohms. Now, all multimeters, and we'll talk a lot more about this next semester, all multimeters have a scale here. And the, the, the number on the scale tells you the maximum value it can read, whether it's resistance or voltage or current or whatever. It can't go any higher than 200,000 ohms. Okay, uh, and so you want it to be on the scale where you get the most significant figures, obviously, we know all about that, and so, but we don't want it to go off scale. If it goes off scale, it's going to show a 1, which means you're off scale. So if you put it on the correct scale, you get four significant figures. If you put it on the next higher scale, you only get three significant figures. So put it on the scale that gives you the most significant figures, uh, and you'll be in good shape. So as long as the, as long as the uh, reading doesn't go over 200,000 ohms, I'm okay. And if it goes below 100 ohms, uh, 100,000 ohms, if it goes below, I should say, 20,000 ohms, that's the next scale down, we want it to turn to the next scale. But again, right now it's got too much resistance. This thermistor has a negative temperature coefficient, which means the hotter it gets, the lower the resistance kind of backwards maybe. So at the high temperature, you probably want to turn this on 20 to get the reading uh, at the high temperature. But right now, we are at 119.3, uh, and it's slowly stabilizing. Uh, when I first picked it up, it was about 110, and you see it just went up to 119.4, uh, and it's slowly coming to room temperature, asymptotically coming to room temperature. Newton had a law for that. It's called Newton's Law of Cooling. He had lots of things figured out. So uh, anyway, it's 119.8 or 8 now, so it's probably just about back to room temperature. And so we'll just leave it sit there until it levels off and stops creeping up, which is really close to. OK. So to assemble this, uh, I've got to touch it. So I don't want to touch it right now. Um, but when it's assembled, it's in this jacket. And the way, the way you assemble it, uh, first of all, you squeeze this little butterfly clip together, and then you scooch the thermistor in between these coils and with the, th with the uh, butterfly clamp in the middle and then let go, and uh, it will clamp that thermistor to the tube. This is a hollow tube, so we're going to run um, uh, steam, that is water vapor. Uh, steam is what you can see, water vapor is what you can't. Uh, we're going to run steam and water or water vapor through here to heat it up to uh, close to boiling and 
and you, you're experts at the barometer, you will be experts at the, reading the barometer, so at today's barometric pressure, water boils at a temperature somewhat below 100 degrees in Atchison. So I think I'm going to say this is stabilized, and I'm going to put the uh, thermistor on there. That's 121.5 kilo ohms. Remember that, 121.5 kilo ohms. We have to figure out what that temperature is. There's a little tag here that has the resistance at each degree, but we want it better than that. We want it uh, in, to the nearest tenth of a degree. We'll talk about that uh, when we talk about the theory here, which is very simple. So, uh, 121.5 kilo ohms. Now, let me assemble this. It's already changed to the lot. It's already, 100, it's already below 100,000 just by handling it because it's a very sensitive device. So, anyway, be very careful. This is a really fine wire here. It's really easy to break, but don't, don't, don't uh, stress it. So, we're going to open this up a little bit, put the slide, the uh, tube into that, and kind of just press, press that down, maybe give it a little help by uh, expanding this so that it's now pretty much insulated, and we haven't stressed that. So we're going to put this in the apparatus, and again, th there's some delicateness to this, so be careful. Uh, in fact, I need to turn it around. Uh, the, the large end goes towards the dial here. Uh, and th there are two clips on this. There's a clip here that's permanently on that spot. There's a groove in the, in the uh, tube to keep it at that spot. It's, it's called a C-clip. And there's another C-clip down here. So those C-clips have to sit, the, the, the far C-clip has to sit in a notch here, back here. And, and the other C-clip, uh, has to go on, and you have to be really careful with this. This is a very sensitive meter. Uh, push this blo aluminum block in until the the tube drops into place, and the block comes back against the C-clip. This is going to give you your reference length, and the length the length that expands that we're measuring is between the C-clips. It's not the entire length of this. It's not that length. It's this length. So you need to measure that length. We're going to call that L0. That's the length to start with. Okay, so it's this length here, right? Okay, so now that this clip is against the uh, aluminum block there, uh, the, the micrometer is reading uh, nicely, but it may, positioning it in the place here may not, have, it may not have settled into its kind of rest position. So very gently give this a push a couple times, and you see it changed. It, it changed dramatically, uh, depending on how gentle you are. So it's changed. It's changed by 10 units on this dial. We'll talk about the units in a minute. And so now I've done this several times, and it keeps going back to something like just a little under nine on the dial. Okay. So the, these these numbers here are hundredths hundredths of a millimeter. Uh, there's a little bitty dial here, kind of like uh, an hour hand, uh, that's actually in millimeters. So if you want to really want to read this accurately, uh, wherever it's set, it's, it's between one and two millimeters, which means it's one millimeter, and uh, it's just a little under nine here. So it's one point, well, let me read it in between the lines here. I can read it, I can even read in between the lines, I can interpolate between that line, like, like you do with a meter stick, and uh, it's about eight-tenths of the way over from between eight and nine. So I'm going to read this as 1.088 millimeters. If you want to forget the one, it's not going to expand more than, well, it may expand actually one millimeter. Uh, these, these will not expand by one millimeter. The aluminum has a bigger expansion coefficient. It may expand by about one millimeter. So this dial may have gone around, so you might want to check the little dial there to make sure if it's between two and three, it's gone to two something millimeters. We'll check that after we start this. Okay. Now the the uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I should have connected 
this so that I don't disturb this at all. Should have connected this. And when I do that, just push this uh, tube on just enough till there's some resistance. It's not going to blow off on you unless you really violently boil things here. I've got a peanut butter lid here to catch the, the drippings uh, from uh, the water that condenses in the tube as it's, as it's heating up the tube. I messed with this, so I'm going to go back over this. And yes, sure enough, it's changed it. So my new reading is 1.067 millimeters. Don't turn this on full. You want the tip of the flame to be right at the bottom of the container. This has got some cool water in it, so I'm going to take a little, a few minutes to heat up. So we're just we're going to be patient because I don't, I don't want you to blast uh, stuff over and uh, uh, steam up the whole place. So uh, adjust this, just turn it on. You can start to hear it hiss when you turn it on. Uh, then at that point, use the uh, the lab lighter. So uh, it takes a long time for this to boil, especially if you've come in and uh, you're the first person of, of the day to do this lab. Uh, and so you have to be patient. Watch, watch pots never boil. Yes, they do eventually. Uh, and so here it's, it's operating at its, uh, at its finest. Uh, a bunch of water vapor, actually steam, is coming out here. And uh, it's reached an equilibrium value. Uh, the meter is reading only 6.4 kilo ohms, so that means I need to run it down to the next scale. Uh, and uh, the next scale too low is too low, it gives me a 1. So I, I have 6.47 uh, kilo ohms as my answer there. So uh, basically, all we need to do is read the, the, the new position on the uh, micrometer which gives me delta L, that's how much the length has changed. And so we have to subtract this number from the previous number we measured earlier. And so my reading here is uh, 1.702 millimeters. 1.702 millimeters, 6.44 kilo ohms. Uh, we'll go over to the board and uh, do my, what, what I say is interpolation to get another decimal point for the temperature. OK, so I'm going to shut this down. Shut it off here. Don't touch anything because it's hot. Uh, it's 99 degrees or thereabouts. So just let it cool off. Uh, do your Boyle's Law lab. Come back. Exchange the, the uh, aluminum rod for a different rod. Uh, carefully assemble it uh, after it's cooled off. And uh, read room temperature. Uh, probably hasn't changed significantly, so you, if, you if you forget to do that, you can use the room temperature that you had in the first place. It's probably still the same. Uh, the room temperature reading on the multimeter is probably still the same. So if you, in the process of assembling, if you don't want to wait for it to finally just cool back down to room temperature, use your old room temperature value. I think that's safe enough. And then uh, repeat the experiment. Uh, again, make sure that uh, at least at first, this is uh, stabilized. If you push this in just slightly a couple times and let it go, and, and the dial comes back to pretty much the same place, then you're good to go. OK, so we're over with this. Um, always be sure to turn the meter off when you're done. That's it. 12 o'clock position. OK, so I just wanted to explain <clears throat> what I mean by interpolation, uh, which you've already done uh, when you read in between the lines, <clears throat> excuse me, in between the lines, literally, on the meter stick, you were interpolating, uh, sort of dividing one millimeter from the next millimeter into tenths or thirds or fifths or whatever you divide it into. But let's divide it into tenths. OK, so uh, here's the example at room temperature. We had uh, a reading of 121.5. We had a reading of 121.5 kilo ohms at room temperature, and so that's somewhere between. And I've got these written backwards because the the thermistor has a negative temperature coefficient between 20 and 21 degrees. It's uh, closer to 21 degrees, right? This number is closer to this number than that number. 
Okay, so here's the way you can do it formally. Uh, you want to find out where this this temperature is in, in this temperature range here. So these two numbers, if you subtract them, the, the temperature, the resistance change for one degree in that particular region of the thermistor is 5.9 kilo ohms per degree change. That's not a linear function either, so that's why we have to do it for each each uh, temperature range. So, so the question is, uh, what's this reading really mean? What, what, what additional significant number can I put there honestly? And so because it's closer to this temperature than this temperature, it's going to be just, a below, just below 21 and quite a bit above 20 degrees. So let's figure out how to, how to figure that out. So if we, if we, uh, if we subtract, uh, if we take this reading here and subtract our reading, it, you'll get 5.3 kilo ohms. So 5.3 kilo ohms is quite a ways for, uh, towards 5.9 kilo ohms. So we have to figure, 5.2, sorry, 5.2 kilo ohms. So we need to take the ratio of 5.2 to 5.9. How, how far is this along a range of up to 5.9? And the answer is it's a little over, it's a little under 0.9, so it's 0.9. So this this temperature here is nine tenths of the way down from this temperature to this temperature. That's all I'm doing. I'm setting up this proportion here. I'm doing it in a very in a very labored way, so that you can't lose if you do it this way. Uh, so these these uh, two readings are 5.9 kilo ohms apart. To, to interpolate in between in a linear interpolation, uh, I find that this reading here is uh, nine tenths of the way from from this value down to this value. Again, it's a negative temperature coefficient. So the, my final reading is 20.9 degrees. That's that's my room temperature reading. There's another example in your handout. For the same thing, but it's it's a little more mysterious if you don't hear what I was thinking when I did this and finally got that. So, 20.9 degrees is room temperature. Our high temperature reading, again, this is a negative resistance, uh, negative coefficient of resistance thermistor. So it's going down and down and down as the temperature goes up and up. Uh, so we got 6.45 kilo ohms. And if I did another interpolation between 95 and, and 96 degrees <laughs> from that little chart, uh, I would get that that's 95.5 degrees. Now, the reason that I'm recommending using this instead of whatever the barometric pressure says the boiling point of water is today is because part, if you notice the equipment, part of the tube was not covered by the insulating jacket. So it really didn't perhaps get as hot as the rest of the tube that's covered by the insulating jacket. So I think that this temperature is probably the more accurate one instead of using the temperature that water boils at today uh, because it's a little bit lower than that because of the fact that the uh, jacket doesn't cover the entire uh, tube from one end to the other between one clip and the other clip, which is the length that we're measuring. So I would read uh, final temperature as doing an interpolation like this between 95 and 96, uh, it turns out to be 95 and a half. So our temperature temperature range is from 95 and a half, uh, uh, the boiling water temperature, uh, roughly, uh, or our high temperature. The difference then is going to be about 74.6 degrees. That's delta T. Okay, that's it.